Well, good afternoon and welcome to another Lunch and Learn. I'm so glad to see uh, you here at our uh, event today. Uh, lots of familiar faces, some new faces, and so, so glad to see you all here today. Uh, as I always do, I, I'm David Dundee. I'm Director of Education and just want to let you know about some future exciting events coming up here at the museum. Our next Lunch and Learn will be on February 22nd, and it'll be me. I'll be talking about time, calendars, uh, as an astronomer, uh, measuring of time with motions in space uh, is uh, something we talk about all the time, so we'll be talking about that. And our, our next uh, virtual guest uh, here at the museum is on February 1st, and we'll have an astronomer from uh, the Hubble Space uh, Telescope Institute uh, talking to us. Uh, we've heard a lot about the hope and oh my, there we go. Uh, its discoveries. Uh, so uh, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope is still in use, and talk about some of the uh, programs that are going on now that the Webb Telescope is up. Our sci-fi nights, our lecture nights uh, continue, and uh, in January, uh, in fact, uh, this Saturday, uh, we'll have the opening of our new exhibit of how to make things, and we'll have some special activities uh, in the in audio's cutting out it in and out. Sorry, um, and uh, we'll be having some special activities that morning uh, until about one o'clock. And then in February, our lecture series continues with Catherine Shepard, astronomer from Georgia State University, talking about unusual stars. And if you're into dinosaurs and you're here today saying, wow, I'm all ears about dinosaurs, I want to let you know that on February 18th, uh, TELUS is launching its very first all-day of dinosaur event called Digging Dinosaurs. We'll have all sorts of things going on uh, in uh, our great hall, all sorts of activities. Uh, in fact, our speaker today will be bringing some other uh, dinosaur bits and pieces and, and uh, things that you can touch. And uh, we'll actually be building a dinosaur that day as one of our many activities. We'll be premiering a planetarium show that day on dinosaurs. We'll have uh, some movies for our youngest paleontologists our great theater, Plagueis, there we go. And uh, thanks to uh, our local public TV station, uh, we will have a guest, uh, Buddy the Dinosaur from Dinosaur Train will be here uh, to uh, say hello. So lots of cool stuff going on that day. And if you're really into dinosaurs, the night before, we'll have a special event, and it's a ticketed event, uh, only uh, 150 tickets for that one for our young, younger uh, paleontologists. Um, and uh, that will be Dinosaurs After Dark. And all the lights will be off in the museum. You'll get your own pith helmets and special flashlights and tour guides to tour the fossil gallery in the dark and see some dinosaurs and do some special activities that night. So lots of cool stuff coming up here at TELUS. Well, our speaker today is uh, Ryan Roney. Uh, he is our curator here at the museum. He's involved with all the exhibitions that go up here at the museum, but his specialty uh, is in ancient things. Actually, he studies, uh, as you, he may tell you, about ancient uh, undersea life long ago and he's close to earning his PhD in that in the next few months, so we're excited about that. But he is our curator, he's a paleontologist, he's a geologist, and uh, I want to have a warm welcome to our speaker today, Ryan. That, there we go. I had somehow muted. Okay. Um, well, thank you, David, for that introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, yes, uh, he talked about me and my job here and all that I do. 
But today I'm gonna to talk about the job that the whole team here was involved in as we got this new um, dinosaur skeleton installed. Um, and we're talking about everything that it took in that. I wanna also thank the, the um, AV team and the, um, uh, the <laughs> sorry, uh, our AV uh, person. <laughs> Um, I, I want to thank the AV team for all doing such a good job on the photos and also for, um, and our marketing team for also documenting this so well. And so everything that we have here is because of their efforts because the rest of us were busy putting up the, the new dinosaur in the, in the exhibition. Um, so for uh, many years here at the museum, this was what we had on exhibit. We had the skull of Lane. Um, it's an impressive piece by itself. Um, this is the dinosaur with the, the largest, you know, you know um, nares, so big, big, huge nose hole. It has really cool features. Those horns are, are, are well known for, um, for the, on the Triceratops. But we didn't have anything to represent the whole organism. Um, and, there was, and there was even the debate whether that space there would hold the whole animal. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about the Triceratops as we get into this. So it was first described in 1888. Um, Oth Oth um, Othniel Charles Marsh, that's of uh, Bone Wars fame, was the one who named it. It was actually discovered by John Bell Hatcher. So this is out west, um, where, and they have all the, all the really good dinosaurs um, being found um, throughout the area in, in, in the west, in, in, the, um, in the Badlands, and, and so New Mexico, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, lots of really good dinosaur material being collected out there. And um, just here, to compare, this is how it was initially reconstructed. Look at its shape, look at the way its head is positioned, its, its, its um, pelvis, and all the orientation, and see those really straight legs in the front, how they have those elbows just out as far as they can go. But then we've, we've realized over the years, this is a more recent reconstruction, and this is the pose of the animal. So one of the things you have to look at before you even get to building a model of an animal uh, and putting the skeleton together is you gotta look at how those bones come together how they interact. And so, um, sorry. So here, yes, all the pieces are there. All the parts are put together in this reconstruction, but they're not put together in the right, um, they're actually stretching some of the joints further than they need to be. They're not putting the, the, the bones in, in, the, in what would be an actual comfortable way for that animal. But come, come to this point here, you see something more that's within that ra um, range of motion for the animal. And the people who um, gather these bones and then make casts and molds and, and, and will put these back together, you, you, they will actually play with those connections and you actually can feel when you look at them how, how stuff goes together. I'm an invertebrate paleontologist. There's, there's very little that would have moved on, uh, on, on some of my animals and, um, that I have. When, when, I get, when you get like on a sea urchin that I study, you got spines and so you have them on a little tubercle and they'll rotate around, that's, that's it. There's no, what's the range of motion or whatever, not as important as when you get to these vertebrates here. So one difference about finding bones out west is it's gonna be very, very dry, very um, brown, just nothing in there. I have some bones here that were found in Georgia that I was, I'm about to show you to show you this process of how you go from bone in the field to a model that would become an, a an animal on, on display. Um, so here's a road cut here in Georgia. Um, even though this is winter, it's a lot more green than you would see even in the summer um, out west when a lot of the field work is done to gather things. Um, a young man, and what's funny is this is a site that I had visited the week before this bone I'm about to tell you about was found. So the young man who found, found um, this bone right here, um, he was just walking around, he knocking on the rocks and he found, and he knocked off this little piece here. Um, he looked at the bottom there, saw that spongy sh shape, and thought this must be a bone. Looked down on the ground and saw where it came out of, and so he started digging further back, and there was more material, and he continued to dig back, and he ended up having the whole femur of a hadrosaur. This is the youngest dinosaur bone found in Georgia. Um, so there's the spot where it came out. There's the bone that, that he pulled out and the piece that he hacked off, and then a little bit of a reconstruction there. So once you have this, kind, this material and you put all that back together and so you use some different putties and other things to help put that together, you have a piece that now resembles the part as the animal had it. Now, a lot of um, 
in the, in the past, a lot of the work that would have been done for that to, to, to make a copy of that would be a cast. So if you've ever been into our fossil dig, we actually have here the rubber molds that you can actually put the material in to make a cast of those bones. And that's what we, uh, on the floor of the fossil dig here is, 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 are these bones from there. But even before you get to that point, you've got to get the item out of the field. Some pieces like this one, the young man was able to just grab and it came out pretty, pretty robustly. Other things are a little crumbly and you want to protect. So in the field, they actually will take and do plaster jackets. So you put some uh, aluminum on the bone surface that you've exposed. And so that aluminum keeps the plaster from sticking to it. And then you cover that with a little bit of burlap. On this piece, you can actually see that burlap. And then you take some plaster. So when this was gathered, this part was what was down below. And so then they gather that, put that on, and now it's hardened. They'll dig out around it, and then you can pull that out and it work back to expose that material, at which point when you bring it home, you cover it, and then you have it to work with. So these are actual bones that were from out west, um, collected by a former um, volunteer here at the museum. Um, he, he got to go out and collect these in person. And so, so even then, some of these pieces are reconstructed. And so you have that shape of the bone preserved, just like this one from Georgia. So these days, you can do the same kind of things with the, with the silicon molds to then make casts with plaster or resin. But you can also scan this material. And the young man, um, Walker Wilson, who donated this specimen to us, he scanned it with a 3D laser scanner. And then he made a 3D model of it. And before he gave it to us, he actually kept him his own 3D printed model of, of the bone. So he has the perfect exact replica of the bone he found at home, but done in some ABS plastic. And then he even painted it so that it looked very similar to that. I don't have a picture of scanning, I don't have a film of, of that scanning process, but I've done 3D laser scanning with fossils, but I've done that with a sea urchin. So here's the object on a turntable. This is a, a heart urchin from, uh, I, this might be Texas or South America, and it's um, being scanned by the laser, a light picture is taken of it, and it just goes all the way around and it scans that image, that object. You can do the same thing with bone, put it in a stand and rotate the stand, or you can also take, have the thing fixed, and they do things where the camera will move around the object to make that 3D, 3D scan. You can do that with lasers, and now there's a lot more with what's called photogrammetry. You can actually take your cell phone and scan, take lots of pictures, talking not just tens, but sometimes hundreds of pictures of something. You can put that into a program. There's even some apps on your phone that you can do that, and it'll give you a 3D model of what you have. Um, there's some challenges and issues with lighting, um, but it's something that you can do on your own, and it can make a model in the computer. Now, this is a model after a few steps, because you you, I would did that laser scan of the item in one way, and then scan it, and then you flip it a different orientation and scan it, and then you take those two scans and join it to make what they call a watertight model. So you make sure that that scan has what are called voxels, because pixels are spaces on, a, on your screen, well, here we're dealing with three-dimensional spaces, so it's a voxel, so it's, it has, puts it all together. I don't know if you've seen in, in, on, on some 3D surfaces, they'll do little triangles together, and, that's so you, and then you smooth that, and that's how you get your, your, your model that can then be exported to a printer to print. So here's a 3D scanned Triceratops. This is actually a new one down in Australia um, that's at some other museums. Uh, but you can also take a 3D scan model, and here's one that is found online, and you can, all the little parts are, are already done together. You can print this yourself. Um, it's designed to go small, but if you've got a, a printer big enough and, and the time, you can make one that's life size, uh, um, and you print your own model of a Triceratops. Now, that's a small one that you can print, but the thing is, the company that, uh, Treebold, um, is the company that we got our, our Triceratops from. They have one that they've made, and they, they talked with us about their 3D printers, their mold processing. They do all of those older techniques and these newer techniques, and they make that dinosaur for us, 
And instead of downloading it like you can for that little small one, they got to ship it to us. And it comes in, a, in this came in two big crates. Uh, we hauled that off. The first one, one person could move with a, with a pallet jack. And we got that back into our storage. But the second one took a much bigger group to move along. And it took us two pallet jacks to move. Um, and so we, we got all that into collections here at the executive director of the museum, proud of us getting this all in. And, uh, um, and also him for scale for the size of those boxes. Um, but a couple weeks later, when the team from Treebold came, they came to help us put it together. We opened things up, and we got to look inside and see all of the goodies, all the things that we were excited to see. Now, if you can see in here, there's a, um, I can't, I can't get the laser. Um, there, if you see on the back of that, there's a little bracket on that wall. One of the interesting things about getting this dinosaur together is you're dealing with not only getting the dinosaur um, to be able to where you can build the parts when it comes here, but shipping it, how to keep it from jostling, how to keep it secure. So these bits and pieces of the dinosaur are actually fastened with custom made fasteners into that, um, into that crating. And so you can see all of those brackets, everything there, the bits of bone are, are, are mounted to those brackets. So we then moved all that out into the gallery the uh, baby Triceratops was a lot more, a lot simpler to put together. Most of the body came in already assembled, and all that we had to add on was the skull and the tail. Um, so that was not as difficult. Um, that's the, two, w this one we call Lily. So here's, why is Lane the Triceratops Lane? That's because the, where the original fossil was found, the rancher who owned the property, that was the name of his grandson, so Lane the Triceratops is named after Lane, the owner of the property's grandson. Well, this uh, baby Triceratops is actually an amalgamation of a few different smaller models. Um, I think in-house at Treebold, they, they've got a nickname for it, but it's not really out as what they, what they call it. So um, our donor who, who purchased the, the models for the museum, we went ahead and, and it's named after his granddaughter, Lily. So the little one is Lily. So the, the, the t model here at TELUS, that's, um, so here's the team now moving this. We've got Ryan and Rory from, the, from Treebold um, who, are all, who are helping us move that those, out of those crates. We've got all this stuff coming out and we get things laid out on, in the gallery space. We're all walking around in, in booties on our feet so that we don't mess up the uh, display area. You can see the uh, skull of Lane that we had before and now these bits of the body. Again, just the scale of the size, uh, two members of, of the team here. Um, Amy is my um, boss and, and, and Rebecca, who's our assistant, uh, our curatorial assistant. Um, th that the legs get, get put there and you see the framework on the bottom. So we're starting to pull that together. Now, those two legs are, are situated in such a way that they're gonna support a lot of weight. On the back there, you see that pelvis there on the right, they've combined the, the sacral vertebra and the, and the pelvis and, the, and that's gotta be lifted up there. That's, that's a pretty large piece. The team here talking with uh, Ryan and Rory, how are we gonna get this up there? We're gonna work this all up on that spot. And so here is a quick time lapse of that build. We've got all that mounted on the legs. So you get the spine, the front legs on there. And then zip, zip, zip. We get the, uh, the, the the ribs put on there. So all that's put together. And we, uh, so one of the things, this is a shot before those ribs got put on there. This is the framework that's gonna hold the weight of everything. The ribs don't weigh all that much. All of this is gonna support what eventually gets added on, the giant skull of this animal. Um, you'll see this, the scale and size of the skull um, and it adds a lot of weight. So you have, in amount of cast bones like these, these are not the real bones, if that wasn't clear before, in cast bones, you actually can put the structure inside the bone. You, you then mold the material around that. If you're doing a mount of real bones, you're gonna make brackets that will hold and hug those bones, and then that will be your support for all the weight. It's gotta be a much stronger and more robust one for, for real bones. Um, that, you know, that's hundreds more pounds, you know, just the bones themselves. Um, 
So then you have that bracket coming up through those legs, holding onto that pelvis, and so then that comes over on, along the spine, just like the body. The spine is that main support for everything. It all is associated off of that. And then you put those forearms out, and inside those arms, th those the, uh, you know, of the humerus, the um, coracoid, uh, uh, the scapula, um, the coracoid, the, the humerus, and down into the radius and ulna, you've got all of that weight being supported with metal, metal um, tubes, square and circular tubes all the way through that. And they're all bracketed together and, and tightened up. Um, but that structure is getting ready to handle that head. Um, so we ended that, end of that first morning, we had that, that, that put together. It actually didn't take all that long to get that part together. But there was an issue. When you look at the color of those bones of the new model, does it match the skull? <laughs> Not at all. So we had to haul that bone down. And, and one of the things to note here is that skull is sitting on a mount that is up, you know, on a, a straight up a vertical mount standing there. And so we wheeled that around. It took a whole bunch of members of the team to bring that down and we wheeled that out. Um, and so we're gonna eventually get that onto that bone. You'll notice here, the little part of the neck, the first uh, vertebra is, is removed because that's part of the connection. But that metal bar that's poking out right there is what's going to support the skull. That one bar right there in that image is what's gonna, being connected back to those legs that are on that frame that's going to be all of the support for the skull. And in real life, that's how the animal, you know, would have supported its head, just like us, you know. We just don't have as big a head as a triceratops. So the crew pushed that out. It, it got a quick tour through the museum, <laughs> um, even, even going past the right flyer, and into the back where we made our, put together um, the walls of our paint booth. Had to be a little bit bigger than the normal um, arrangement. And it got primed that first day. Now it's completely the wrong color. Um, and, and the next day they did some airbrushing and we get a lot closer to the color to match the rest of the body, um, the rest of the bones of the body. And so that, that second day we actually mounted these new pterosaurs that you'll see when you go out there that are now soaring above the, uh, the triceratops. Um, that was a whole other um, fun part with, with lifts and, and two different lifts to do that. One that'll reach out and then the, then the scissor lift and getting wires mount, you know, mounted to the ceiling to hang down um, and the team doing that. I've been up on that scissor lift that high and, and I am not a fan, <laughs> not whatsoever. Um, you, you, you think it's fine that you've got the, the area around you but somehow when you are, get up higher, that, that little platform, even though you've got bars right at your chest level, and you know physics-wise, you're not going to tip over. It just seems to look a lot smaller right at your feet because now you've got all that distance below you. So the next day, that's that newly painted skull made its way back out. The whole, t you know, it takes, you see how many people it takes to move this, um, get this thing back up there. So now we're ready to, to move it. But I mentioned earlier, here we have this vertical mount on this skull. This is, but this is actually a, a different view from how it used to be on the, on the gallery. And now you've got that horizontal connection into the spine of the rest of that body. How do we navigate that? How do we deal with that? So again, there's that bar that, that, that's supposed to receive that skull into it. So another challenge that we had to do was that bar that is up and down on that specimen, we had to actually get a new bracket. They had to make a new bracket you see the, the vertical bar that's holding the skull and actually has a piece that goes up underneath the palate of, of the, um, underneath the mand mandibles, uh, sorry, the, the maxilla, underneath the maxilla. It's actually reaching up under there to hold that and, bra and bracket that. But somehow we got to go from that vertical holding because that was put inside the mold. Normally we would have had the mold made with that horizontal bracket inside that material. Well, we're dealing with the pre-made material, but we didn't want to pay for a new skull. So this is the bracket that they, that they made. So there was a little bit of welding that had to be done, a lot of drilling and, 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 and but so here's the, here's the dirty little secret about this mount. 
the skull is just a couple of inches too, too high because that occipital um, right there would, would connect into the, the, the cervical vertebra of the neck. But that's where the little bracket's coming out. So we actually had to put it just a little bit higher to make that connection work with the way the mounting was done before. As big as the animal is, you guys don't see that and it really doesn't matter. It looks more like just the animal has shifted its head a little. But when, you look up, look, when looking up close, getting up underneath that, that um, flange of the neck, you, that's what you would see. So that, that is what was done to actually make that work. So here's that day of mounting that head. We actually had to lift it up twice. Um, and so if you, I don't know if you saw that. Um, I think that I'll let this play again. Uh, it's gonna, uh, hopefully it'll loop um, one more time. Um, let me see here. We're gonna try that one more time. Pay attention to when that neck, when that head finally hits on that body. You'll see the whole thing flex. Just give that a good look. Watch how they finally get that on there and you see that just how it settles in there. That's that weight of, all, of that animal, of that skull. So just think about in real life how much that animal is having to hold. So again, here we are, we're all figuring out how we're gonna hold this, this skull together. It's still attached to that vertical mount. We get it up there, the new connection is not going in. It's, it's touching, it goes in just a little bit and it sticks. So we actually had to pull it down um, and, and, and we actually had to grease it up. So that, that was where we lift it up, we put it up, it was sticking and then we had to drop it back down. And so we greased the hole to make that work and we, we repositioned ourselves, we got it on there and as that was sitting there, it's holding, it's in. Everyone lets the weight go, but you hold it where you are, and it creeps and it popped, and it was scary. And then it held, but but it was and, and Ryan, the guy from Treebold, is assuring us it's this is what's supposed to happen. This is what's supposed to happen, and the rest of us are thinking, here's this this material that's just going to collapse on top of us and around us, and and we're not going to have this thing done in time. Um, I think also as we're trying to get this done, we had um, scheduled with the uh, reporter from the local newspaper to come take pictures and do everything. So we're also, we'd created, we had created our own time crunch that was, that just made it extra complicated. Um, so it all stuck there. And so then we're all under, under there holding the piece now that, that was on that bracket, that vertical bracket. And we cut that off, a little bit of angle grinding right there and we're done. That's Ryan and Rory, the team that, that came from Treebold and put that together. And then, it was, so we had that mount. The new scene is there as you see it. Uh, but there's one, other, there's a few other things missing we'll talk about in just a moment. But we all take our pictures as a team. Yay, we did it, we got it together. Um, our donor um, got his picture with, with everything. This is Mr. Michael Mayo Mackey. Um, and then Jose, Thanks him, and actually it's a lot of thanks to the team from Treebold and to the team that I work with. You know, I, I really was just there as also a helper. I was not a big instrumental part in making this happen. It was so many people. We all just, the, the team really puts that together. But after that was there, Ryan from Treebold had to do some more touch-ups on that, on that skull just to make sure that it did look just right. And the, the team from, our, from here in our company um, put together the, the uh, area underneath the, the, to, to cover up that framework on there. So that part about painting, I, I, when I talked about the molds and doing everything, that takes your pigments and things. And so you have a mold. I wanted to show you some of that process. These are things that you may have done. Um, so like you have an object in a mold. This is another one. And then that object can come out of the mold, but it's whatever material you made that object out of. So, you know, you take those molds, you're gonna need some pigments. This is actually some umber from here, uh, New Riverside Ochre, but you can use that and some acrylic paints. Like say, for instance, this ammonite mold, a um, cast that was made. This is just plaster, but you paint it a little bit, it looks more like how it naturally comes out. It's the same thing with the bones of this dinosaur. They've taken and painted it to look more like the way it came out when it was dug out of the ground. Um, so 
The same thing in our fossil dig. We've, we've got those molds, these molds here. We've cast that material, put that in the floor of the fossil dig, painted it. And so you have that more um, realistic experience with that material. Um, sometimes you can make, take your molds here, which are a little, uh, you know, you don't want to use too much in there, but you can take plastic and make a mold that fits in that, and then that's a reusable mold for activities that we've done in the past with kids here at the museum. This is a velociraptor claw, so you can make that mold. So this process is the older process that made these bones, but the painting and other skills are still used regardless of how you do it. And so um, you have a, different, a few different ways to, to get, make these bones, but the, the building of it is, is the same in all these different places. Um, and so um, with that, I'm just grateful we have that and you guys can enjoy that. Do I have any questions? If you have a question, raise your hand. I'll come over and with the mic. So we're recording this and broadcasting this so uh, everyone can hear you. So first question right here. Where would you hold the uh, skull to lift it up onto the mount? Okay, so we actually had um, a couple of different spots on the skull that we used right there around that frill. It was a nice, strong, robust area. Up underneath in the mouth, you, so that, that jawbone, that mandible, you don't want to touch. That's just connected on there with some wires. Um, so we didn't touch that. But underneath, we actually had a bracket that's there that goes all the way along that pallet. So you can actually hold the bracket um, right up there by the, man, by the maxilla, that's the, the roof of the mouth. And so that actually was another spot we had someone holding that to lift. And you had people at the, on the back side of that new bracket that we were going to put in on the side of the skull. And I was actually underneath holding that vertical, that vertical and lifting that. And we had two other people that were holding the base of that vertical to, to pick it all up. Um, so that's how we, we did all that. So I have two questions. So the head is not the original for the body. So the head and body are all copies of the same Lane Triceratops. And one of the things I didn't talk about was you don't have all those bones found in the field when they make that. So, but all you need is half of the bones. So if I have a bone from this side and I have a different bone from this side, I can make mirror images and I now have the body. Uh, you know, you go through most of the body and you can get all that together. So the, the company Treebold, they sell the, the whole skeleton together, or you can just buy the skull. And so at the time, we, we got the skull um, back in the early days of TELUS, and then we wanted to have the rest of the skeleton, so we were able to get the rest of it together. But because we didn't order that skull and skeleton together, that bracket on the skull was not the correct kind. It was oriented upwards versus backwards, and we needed the other way. So that's why we had to make that adjustment. So the second question is, how much does that weigh? Um, I actually don't remember the weights on each of these. This, um, that, that I'd have to look at the shipping manifest for even the skeleton to let you know kind of the weight. Um, but the material is actually, in and of itself, pretty lightweight. The largest weight on these is the metal brackets that are in it. You know, it's, 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 um, it is kind of a resin material. It's, you know, it's a plastic material that's dense, but it's not extremely heavy, even the real bone would actually be much heavier. I had a question. Are the, is the metal pole still there? Yes, the metal is still, is in there. That's how it's all held together. You, it's, it's designed such that you can't see it very well. Um, but if you are in there and you peek around the bottom of that frill, you can see those, that bit of bracketing that we've done. But there's a, and actually if you look where the feet are over that platform, there's just a little bit of metal that's coming down out of the wrists and ankles that actually goes into the ground to that main square, squared off bracket that's on the ground for that frame. So you can see just a few little spots, but that's part of what they do when they put those models together and they design them, is they take that cast and they try to do it as efficiently to obscure the bracketing so that it looks like it's the bones holding things together. My question is, how much long did it take? So the putting it together here takes just those two days that we did. We put the body together really in the morning in just a couple of hours. And then the skull, it took them most of the day to repaint that. We mounted it that next morning. But by 1 or 2 in the afternoon the next day, it was all done. But the printing and the making of the molds, each of those bones can take 
days to print if they're doing, and there's different kinds of printers. There's resin printers, there's uh, plastic filament printers, um, th so, some of those, and others they do resin where they have a cast and they pour that mold in there, but that takes a day or two to dry, especially as you get to thicker pieces, then you have, the, the, you know, that, a lot of those are exothermic processes, so they have to dry, and they have to make sure that sometimes if, if the mixes, the mixes can actually crack, so there's all kinds of different things that happen there, um, but you have, but when we order one of these, the, the turnaround time, making it, shipping it, is six months. Um, where did the old bracket connect to the skull? So it was, it's still in that connection. I showed you in that picture. Um, let me go back a um, little ways back. So you can see right there the upward bracket, and then there's another one that makes an L that's upside down. So it's going straight up into the skull just forward of the little knob called the occipital, which is where the skull attaches to the, the vertebra. So they, that other metal bracket was then attached to that vertical bracket and then made that L bend into the bracket that's within the, 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 the vertebra. How long did you go to school for for your paleontology major? So, um, too long. Uh, <laughs> my, my master's degree was two years. My undergrad was actually in geology was a second two-year thing. I did a previous one in, in uh, Spanish with a minor in geology. Uh, but then I did my PhD, and I'm still in my PhD, so it's been eight years that I've been in school, because I've been working here for five years, so progress slows down when you work and, and stuff, but that's been the, the time I'm in. So it, it takes a while. Well, I have two questions. One, are there any other creatures related to it in the museum? And two, how big is this specimen? So the, um, the, the skull itself is eight feet long, so the whole animal is 24, 26 feet. I, I, I'm trying to remember the exact number there. Um, the Triceratops is related to the other dinosaurs that you see on exhibit. Um, and so the closest relative to the Triceratops is the Hadrosaurus that sits across the way, because both the Triceratops and the Hadrosaurus are what are called Ornithischians. And so then the other dinosaurs that are on exhibit are the Brontosaurus, the um, Dromaeosaurus, and the Triceratops, sorry, sorry, the, the Tyrannosaurus rex, and the Appalachosaurus. So this, this um, Brontosaurus is a sauropod, and then the um, Triceratops and the Appalachosaurus, sorry, the Tyrannosaurus rex and the Appalachosaurus, those are theropods that are really closely related, those are Tyrannosaurs. And then the dr dromaeosaurs are other theropods that are related to those, and they are probably the animals that lead to the lineage to birds. So that's the, all the dinosaurs on exhibit. And there's a whole lot of other um, relatives to those. All right. Uh, we have evaluation forms out uh, on the tables. I would love to get some input from you and suggestions from everyone. And uh, Ryan will be around for a few minutes after this if you have some more questions or just want to meet our, our famous curator. And uh, let's have a big round of applause for Ryan. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today.